Few genres have had the lasting impact of punk. 1976 is one of those seismic, dividing lines in popular music. A history-destroying year zero. The point after which everything changed. It was the year the Ramones' debut was released. The year that the first singles from the UK punk scene were set loose upon an unprepared public. And while the punks wanted to remove themselves from the past, burn all that had come before, nothing happens within a vacuum. These bands didn't appear out of nowhere with the key principles of the genre locked in place. This innovative, minimalist, free chords and the truth, turbo-powered, rebellious music had to have a precedent. There were other artists that led up to this era-defining moment in music that were either forgotten, ignored, or not given credit. This is how punk became punk. The beginnings of punk rock at its most elemental are entwined with the first shouts of rock and roll. Though its origins can be found in the work of Sister Rosetta Farp, Muddy Waters, Bo Diddley, and the Ike Turner penned Rocket 88. V8 motor is smart and designed, black convertible top and the gals don't mind. Little Richard is the inception point for onstage anarchy. With his raucous piano-led compositions about taboo-busting subject matter, twinned with his wild hoarse scream. Why you don't know what you do to me to the booty? Oh, no. On 1955's Tutti Frutti, Richard impacted every wild man of rock forever after, having a great effect on Iggy Pop, Lou Reed, Patti Smith, and Lemmy from Motorhead. From the world of country, a lasting influence in punk was Johnny Cash and his outlaw persona. But that train keeps rolling on down to San Antonio. Folsom Prison Blues, first recorded in 1955, featured the iconic line But I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die I sat with my pen in my hand, trying to think up the worst reason a person could have for killing another person, and that's what came to mind. Compared to Cash, Eddie Cochran's Teen Rebellion on 1958's Summertime Blues is almost laughably twee. I'm a gonna raise a fuss, I'm a gonna raise But backed by his over-revved guitar, is more in sync with the snotty first-generation punks, especially on the turbocharged Something Else. It's something else. Also from 1958, the ragged hollers and ramshackle instrumental of Jerry Lott, aka The Phantom, a masked Avenger come rockabilly singer on Love Me. Gone is a day, I can't wait. Love me. would push the Presley template of rock and roll to its breaking point and become a favourite of the Cramps. In 1959, on the other side of the Atlantic, Vince Taylor and his playboys were ripping through the similarly energetic rockabilly of Brand New Cadillac. Well, my baby drove up in a brand new Cadillac. And giving The Clash extra material for their London Calling double album. Link Ray and his Raymen had managed to get the low grumble of his instrumental song, Rumble, banned from US radio in 1958. Its distortion achieved by slashing the amp's speaker cone with razor blades. But Ray did more for punk than those hefty gnarled chords. For 1960s The Girl Can't Dance, the Raymen teamed up with blues shouter Bunker Hill. Hill's vocals so intense, it feels like the speakers are tearing apart. While in 61's Jack the Ripper, Ray would add surf guitar to his tough rockabilly, and up the tempo to get even closer to the punk sound. While rhythm and blues rather than rock and roll, the high energy early material from James Brown would prove elemental. Alongside Brown's powerful commanding vocal and stage presence, a key calling point for Iggy Pop. Are his relentless backing band, the famous Flames, as heard on their 1962 Live at the Apollo album. Our whole thing was based on James Brown. We listened to Live at the Apollo endlessly on acid, 
Everything we did was on a gut level about sweat and energy. It was anti-refinement. That's what we were consciously going for. The Pharaohs, Richard Berry, had recorded Louie Louie in 1957, hidden as a B-side to their version of You Are My Sunshine. But it wasn't until the Kingsmen got their grimy hands on it in 1963 that it became a proto-punk staple. Covered by everyone from the Kinks to Black Flag. That driving rhythm, basic chords, simplistic keyboard line and singer Jack Ely's vocals so indecipherable that the FBI investigated them for obscenity. But the sloppiness was the allure. If these inept Portlanders could have a US number two hit with Fredbear rock and roll, anyone could. By the end of the year, the Trash Men had released the belching roller coaster gibberish of Surfing Bird and reached number four. <laughs> In the aftermath of these two singles, Garage Rock began to take over the US. In the UK, bands were compiling their own primal proto-punk 45s. Though there is a case to be made for Johnny Kidd and the Pirates shaking all over. Shaking all over. Or even the opening chords of the Beatles, I Wanna Hold Your Hand. The first real example appeared in August 1964. The Kinks, You Really Got Me. Girl, you really got me going. Inspired by Louie Louie and built around power chords, the song is famous for its particularly fuzzy guitar tone. Again from Dave Davies performing some razor blade surgery on his amp. They would continue to use that sound on all day and all of the night and tired of waiting for you. But You Really Got Me remains the urtex for heaviness in rock. Assembled from merely three chords, Gloria by Northern Irish group Them, released in December 1964, would also become highly covered by beginner punks. Its shouty spell along refrain, retained by Patti Smith for her abstract revisioning. In 1965, following on from the Kinks distorted fuzz, were the Rolling Stones with their uber rift, I can't get no satisfaction. The basis for the song came to Keith Richards in a dream, though originally he wanted a horn section to beef up his guitar line, akin to dancing in the street. Lacking that, he implemented the newly released Gibson Fuzz Tone Distortion Unit, designed so that teenagers wouldn't keep wrecking their amps with sharp objects. Mick Jagger's lyrics, focusing on his personal dissatisfaction with the status quo, would become a key punk theme. Also in London in 1965, The Who were expressing the intergenerational divide between the mods and their greatest generation parents. Via thundering bass solos, lunatic start-stop rhythms. And a whole lot of stuttering to imply Roger Daltrey's true radio unfriendly feelings. Why don't you all fade away? My generation's most famous lyric. Exemplifies the song's confrontational sentiment. Simply, I'd rather be dead than become boring like you. Previously recorded by the Wild Ones but never charting, the primordial caveman rock of Wild Thing was made a worldwide hit by the Trogs in 1966. Wild you make my heart sing. Songwriter Chip Taylor didn't take his three chord garage rock song all too seriously. Wild Thing came out in a matter of minutes. The pauses and the hesitations were a result of not knowing what I was going to do next. (laughs) 
while garage rock bands were releasing singles and going top 10 in the US and UK. In Lima, Peru, Los Psychos were making their own rambunctious sound in isolation. In essence, they furthered the surf guitar influenced rock and roll of Link Ray and Dick Dale, making it dirtier, gnarlier, and tying it together with the blood curdling shrieks of guitarist vocalist Erwin Flores. <laughs> Released in 1965, Demolition, with its lyrics alluding to smashing shit up, was a massive hit in their native Peru. The band broke up in 1966 and were unknown to the rest of the world, until around the year 2000, when through the internet they received deserved credit as early punk innovators. Back in the US, through access to cheaper instruments and wanting to replicate the likes of Louie Louie and the British Invasion, teenage garage rock bands were popping up all over the country, most earning one hit and then fizzling out. Following on from fellow Pacific Northwest groups, the Kingsmen and the Whalers, Tacoma Washington's The Sonics were an exception, as they never had that first Billboard hit, but their use of speed, aggression and heaviness was the template that later bands would refine. The 1965 song Psycho was all machine gun drum fills, distorted screams, and cold eyed nihilism. Preempting punk's no future mentality, the belief in nothing mindset would be advanced with the last track on New York underground band The Fugs' 1965 debut. Monday, nothing. Tuesday and Wednesday, nothing. Musically, they weren't punk but their ethos was, taking their name from a euphemism for the word fuck, their song swaying between politically charged and scatological, the FBI's review, the most vulgar thing the human mind could possibly conceive. Hailing from El Paso, Texas, in December 1965, the Bobby Filler 4 riled up an old track by the crickets about the outlaw life and got themselves a US number nine hit. I bought the law and the later covered by The Clash. Boise, Idaho's Paul Revere and the Raiders, I'm Not Your Stepping Stone, from May 1966, would be another simple, vaguely anti-authority song that bands love to cover. Whether that was The Monkees, Sex Pistols, or the entirety of the Washington DC hardcore scene, said punk historian Michael Azarad. At Minor Threat's second show, each of the seven bands on the bill covered the tune. On the crunching 7 and 7 hits, Love ramped up the tempo even further, with its light speed drums needing more than 30 takes to get right. Arthur Lee's teenage frustration channeled for its percussive, non-verbal rallying cry. And yet it still made the US top 40. Released in August 1966 and utilizing a Vox Continental organ as the weapon of choice, Question Mark in the Mysterians' 96 Tears would be the first Garage Rock number one single. And you'll start crying. Later, getting a name drop on the Cramps' Human Fly. I got 96 tears, 96 eyes. But the most out there of all, at least geographically, were the monks. Five American GIs stationed in West Germany. They wore robes and bald heads and released a single, truly odd album, Black Monk Time in 1966. Free from the traditional bounds of rock and roll, with the lurching proto kraut rock of I Hate You. They hacked up a venomous glob of bile. Hey, well, I hate you with a passion, baby. Yeah. In 1972, 27 of these garage rock tracks were brought together on the first Nuggets compilation album. A way of making sense of this explosion of like minded, vaguely psychedelic bands across the US from between 1965 and 68. Key tracks included on the double LP comp were Los Angeles band The Standells, number 11 hit, Dirty Water. Well, I love that dirty water. 
The Electric Jug Augmented Austin, Texas Group. The 13th Floor Elevators with You're Gonna Miss Me. The original Minneapolis Punks, The Castaways, with Liar Liar. The Count Five, with the twisted sexual groove of Psychotic Reaction. And The Seeds with Anti-Cop Anthem, Pushing Too Hard. Put together by future Patti Smith band guitarist Lenny Kay, his liner notes for the set contains one of the earliest journalistic uses of the phrase punk rock to describe this kind of music. The name that has been unofficially coined for them, punk rock, seems particularly fitting in this case, for if nothing else they exemplify the berserk pleasure that comes with being outrageous on stage, the relentless middle finger drive and determination offered only by rock and roll at its finest. The Velvet Underground are the definitive proto-band. Most rock-based genres, you can usually trace the lineage back through them. Punk, goth, alternative, shoegaze, post-rock, tweet. They have a track that started that. Released in 1967, The Velvet Underground and Nico introduced the world to their New York sleaze contorted skeletal compositions, and Lou Reed's half-song sneer. Their song sang without metaphor about sadomasochistic sex. Shiny, shiny, shiny boots of leather. And drug addiction. Cause it makes me feel like I'm a man when I put a spike into my vein. But their second album, White Light, White Heat, had the bigger impression on punk. It's a very rabid record. The first one had some gentility, some beauty. The second one was consciously anti-beauty. The centerpiece is Sister Ray. Three elemental chords riffed on for 17 whole minutes. Feedback drenched primal and about sex, drugs and guns. It would inspire all from Jonathan Richmond and Noy to Buzzcocks and Joy Division. But their influence extended beyond that. John Cale, their Welsh viola player, an essential to their hypnotic drone, would go on to produce the debuts of The Stooges, Modern Lovers and Patti Smith. Just as much a forerunner to metal as punk, Detroit's Motor City 5, or the MC5 for short, added a politically charged aspect as well as intensity and speed to the protopunk formula. Recorded live in October 1968, their incendiary debut single, Kick Out The Jams, commented on the overindulgent, overlong jam sessions of late 60s rock and roll, preferring their music as short, sharp shocks. Music critic Lester Bangs, though, wasn't a fan, feeling their basic song compositions were uninspired. Kick Out The Jams sounds like Barrett Strong's Money, as recorded by The Kingsman. Signed to Electro Records, the Kick Out of the Jams album managed to make its way to number 30 on the Billboard chart. The title track's opening, Exhortation, being one of the first uses of the word fuck on a major label release. Sing out the jams, this would prove controversial and twinned with their revolutionary rhetoric. The MC5 would soon be kicked from Electra, sealing their legacy. From Ann Arbor, Michigan, just outside Detroit, with the Stooges. Led by Jim Osterberg, aka Iggy Pop, a frontman with a Jim Morrison meets James Brown voice, and an appetite for destruction on stage. Rolling in shards of broken glass, smearing his bare torso with peanut butter, as well as being the arguable originator of stage diving. I Wanna Be Your Dog from their 1969 self-titled debut is composed of Ron Ashton's feedback-drenched three-chord riff, Sleigh bells and a one-note piano drone courtesy of producer John Gale. And a grimy lyric that dwells within sexual submission. Now I wanna be your dog. 
it's the idea of like I want to unite with your body. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about literature with you yeah. or something. You know, I don't want to like judge you as a person. I right. want to dog you. you I know? Dog. Follow up 1970s Funhouse would push the boundaries of hard rock cacophony. But with 1973's David Bowie produced Raw Power, the band had formed the template for future punk, with the amphetamine thrash of Search and Destroy. All punk bands since took notice. Sex Pistols' Steve Jones learned how to play guitar along to Raw Power, and it was a favourite of Kurt Cobain. At the time of their 1967 debut, Safe as Milk, Captain Beefheart and his magic band were being pushed by their label A&M as the American Rolling Stones. Inspired at first by classic rhythm and blues like Howling Wolf and Screaming Jay Hawkins, which they then perverted by the addition of free jazz time signatures and abstract poetry, the band was rock and roll at its most avant-garde. Their masterwork is 1969's Trout Mask Replica. Uneasy, jagged and argumentative music, it was rehearsed for eight months in cult-like fervor, band members being isolated, starved, ridiculed and made to submit to their idiosyncratic frontman. She wears her pants like a prison, takes her fancy in the pants. Produced by Frank Zappa, it found fans in Beck, PJ Harvey, radio DJ John Peel, and the more oddball punks and new wavers. It was anti-music in the most interesting and insane way. All the bum notes that I was being told off for by the teachers were finally being released by well-known artists. That was my confirmation. From then on, there was room for everything. In Britain, 1969, a key text for the punk movement would appear in an unlikely place. Led Zeppelin's debut took blues rock and pushed it to breaking point, but amongst the shameless fests from the old masters was the relentless two and a half minute thrash of communication breakdown. Jimmy Page's rapid fire downstroke guitar would shape Johnny Ramone's technique, who practiced it for hours in anticipation for his future band's Blitzkrieg. The UK was also producing its own scene of proto-punk groups. It emerged from the countercultural scene centred on Ladbroke Grove in West London, which had itself spun off from the hippie movement. Bands like Pink Fairies and Third World War would infuse a threadbare half-learnt version of rock and roll with political radicalism, especially a belief in anarchy, along with a do-it-yourself ethos. The biggest of these bands was Hawkwind. Though often seen as simply another space-obsessed prog group, Hawkwind were anti-musicians. Why play something complex when something simple and repetitive could be just as loud? Live, there were a torrent of noise, upwards of six musicians, all pounding out a pulverizing, rhythmic drone, with accompanying lights and projections, making their shows unlike anything else in the early 70s. John Lydon, Joe Strummer, and The Dam's Captain Sensible all grew up absorbing Hawkwind at free festivals, and the band even managed to grab a UK number three hit in 1972 with Silver Machine. As Stephen Morris from Joy Division said, punk rock started because in every small town there was somebody who liked Hawkwind. That said, Hawkwind's tendency towards serious-minded epics ran counter to two of punk's core values, brevity and flash. Glam rock provided both. The glittery, challenging androgyny of David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust period reaffirmed the power of the pop song yet challenged the received wisdom of previous generations. Bowie's 1972 performance of Starman on BBC's Top of the Pops sent shockwaves throughout the UK, 
leaving smitten teenagers and outraged parents in their wake. Starman provoked the outrage, but album track Hang On To Yourself provided the stripped down musical kick that would be central to punk's approach. Based on a mutated rockabilly riff and with lyrics referencing stolen guitars and partying with groupies, it was far tougher and more energetic than the Ziggy era singles and strongly influenced tracks like the Ramones' Teenage Lobotomy. If Bowie was Glam's Alien Prince, T-Rex's Mark Boland was its court jester. Spending four weeks at number one on the UK singles chart in 1972, Metal Guru is a two and a half minute sugar rush that kicks off with Boland's joyful, slightly off-key wailing. <laughs> and continuing with an exaggerated swagger that demands attention whether you like it or not. Solid Gold Easy Action, a number two hit for the group that same year, is even more revved up, a mere 140 seconds of hyperactive sexual gibberish, delivered with a one chord riff that couldn't be more simple or primal. It's hardly a surprise that Boland was one of punk's earliest and most enthusiastic supporters, even going so far as to invite the damned on tour as T-Rex's opening act. Splitting the difference between Bowie's cool reserve and T-Rex's cartoon outbursts, Roxy Music added layers of retro irony and art school pretense that were a direct influence on first wave punk bands like Susie and the Banshees, who formed after they met at a Roxy Music gig. Unlike Bowie or T-Rex, frontman Brian Ferry projected a self-conscious, almost noble arrogance that allowed his band to rewrite the rules of what a rock band could be. Roxy's 1973 single, Do The Strand, recycled one of rock and roll's most essential commands. Everyone, dance. You know what I mean. Do the strand. But while Do The Strand's driving, relentless energy provides the musical backbone, the real spirit of the song is about destroying the cliches of the past and reclaiming their rebellious heart for the present. In the US, glam rock wasn't as widespread or influential as it was in the UK. It was, however, darker and grittier. Instead of the refined polish of Bowie and Roxy, the New York dolls were messy and depraved, the seedy underbelly of all the glamour. The 1972 single, Personality Crisis, shares the broad, euphoric stump of UK glam, but there's nothing joyful about his tale of decadent burnouts. Not only did the song set the stage for the coming punk wave, the band itself were at its creation. Their manager, Marty Fowl, went on to be a driving force of the New York punk underground, and Malcolm McLaren was their UK manager at the same time he was developing what would become the Sex Pistols. While glam rock itself had failed to capture the hearts of American audiences, the genre's love for spectacle and high volume found a home in one of the US's biggest rock acts. Alice Cooper's entire existence was an enormous blast of glam values and punk energy, mixing flashy theatrics and bratty rock and roll to create a massively successful juggernaut of teenage rebellion and parental outrage. Their 1972 single, Schools Out, called to the snotty, no future youth, a full five years before the Sex Pistols would do the same on God Save the Queen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Run, 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 run. While hotspots like London and New York were pumping out bands with protopunk aspirations, across America things were getting a whole lot punkier. The Flaming Groovies were based in San Francisco but rejected the peace and love associated with the city. Not going for drawn out soloing, but more straight ahead sleazy rock and roll. The track Teenage Head, from the 1971 album with the same name, is adolescent alienation writ large. Half 
For Roadrunner, Boston's Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers took the hypnotic drone of Velvet Underground's Sister A and crafted that two chord thrum into a song about the simple pleasure of driving the open road with the radio on. Initially recorded in 1972, but not being released until 76, its rudimentary ethos would bleed into the UK punk scene. If you could write something as basic as Roadrunner, you could form a band. Not to be confused with the Florida death metal band, Detroit's death by the early 70s were playing a relentless, energetic version of virtuoso, politically charged rock and roll, informed by the who and funk, but with a speed comparable to Black Flag. Their single, Politicians in My Eyes, predating the Ramones' debut by a year, though virtually unheard of in their heyday, Death has since been rediscovered and rightly heralded as forerunners of the punk sound. Mid-70s Ohio was home to the erratic, lowercase electric eels. And later, the angular nerd punk of Devo. But no other band summed up the hopelessness of Cleveland, quite like Rocket from the Tombs. Together for less than a year, their Stooges and Velvet Underground affected protopunk went hard and fast about the absolute wretchedness they felt, summed up all too well in the bleak confession of Ain't It Fun. Ain't it fun when you know that you're gonna die young? It's such fun. Rocket from the Tombs was always doomed. Everything from Cleveland was doomed. Rocket from the Tombs is totally inconsequential and irrelevant. That is the power of Cleveland. Embrace my brothers, the utter futility of ambition and desire. In August 1975, the band imploded and fractured into the arty Pear Ubu and the more straight-ahead punk Dead Boys, each stealing songs from their previous project. Rockets never recorded an album. What we have is bootlegs and demos, but the tales of their self-destructive live shows and powerfully anguished tunes still had a strong effect on the Ramones, television, and the fall. Splintering off from Kraftwerk in 1971, Klaus Dinger and Michael Roffer formed Noi. They expanded on the work of fellow krautrock group, Can including adopting the motoric beat, a hypnotically 4-4 beat that is usually repeated ad nauseum. They were a new kind of rock band. They stripped away the idea of a song and riff, and they made texture everything. Hero of Noi 75 would be the most akin to what punk would become. Joy Division, Seizing the Banshees, and a whole lot of post-punk would aspire to their minimalism, while many upon first hearing the Ramones would think it was someone ripping off Noi. <laughs> Fittingly, the album that sits at the exact point where rock went punk in the USA opens with the track, The Next Big Thing. The Dictator's 1975 debut album, Go Girl Crazy, could not have been more prescient in its iconoclastic mix of power chords and juvenile humour. An early fan of the group, one Jeffrey Hyman, embraced the band's irreverent attitude when he changed his name to Joey and fronted his own band, The Ramones. Punk in New York City was centred around the club CBGB's, and Patti Smith's debut album Horses was the first album to emerge from that scene in November of 1975. Gloria, the album's first track, starts with a declaration that is a fitting start for the punk rock movement. Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. Released in February 1976, the Ramones debut single Blitzkrieg Bop is the first US record that is definitively punk. Many of the core elements that comprise American punk rock find their start here. Glue-sniffing delinquency, a deep love of pulp culture, 
and of course the marriage of bubblegum pop with brutal rock and roll. The track's opening line. Aye, oh, let's go. Aye, oh, let's go. Would go on to be the band's unofficial slogan. The first band to actually play CBGBs was Television, initially formed around lifelong friends Tom Verlaine and Richard Hell. The band started with the same mindset of the others in the scene, but soon Verlaine outgrew punk's initial primitivism. Their musical cues started to come from free jazz more than rock and roll, which alienated Hell who left and was replaced by bassist Fred Smith. By the time Television released their debut single, Little Johnny Jewel, in 1975, they had become something considerably more complex. Where other acts were stripping things down to two minute bursts of energy, Little Johnny Jewel was a full seven minutes long, cut in half to fit on both sides of the single. Barely a week from his exit from television, Hell joined New York Dolls alumni Johnny Funders and Jerry Nolan to form the Heartbreakers, attempting to write a better song than the Velvet Underground's heroine. The song Chinese Rocks actually originated with Dee Dee Ramone, who brought it to Hell after it was rejected by Johnny Ramone due to its subject matter. Hell put some finishing touches on the track, and while it quickly became a signature song for the group, they wouldn't record it until after Hell's departure for their debut album, LAMF. A couple of years later, Johnny Ramone relented. The Ramones recorded their own version for their 1980 album, End of the Century. After leaving television, then the Heartbreakers, Richard Hell formed his own group, Richard Hell and the Vidoids. The band's signature song, Blank Generation, was a leftover from Hell's days in television and became the title track of their debut album in 1977. The off-kilter guitars and Hell's manic delivery solidifying the track as one of the defining moments of art punk. As Bowie, Zeppelin and The Who were off playing arenas and in America, the British pub rock scene was thriving within the back rooms of London and home counties boozers. A loose collective with a name to go back to basics, pub rock's only true through line was being loud enough to be heard over the clientele's drunken merriment, taking in country rock, hard-nosed R&B and white funk. Dr. Feelgood were in the muscular R&B mode, featuring the sweat-spattered, eye-bulging frontmanning of Lee Brillo, and the choppy, confrontational guitar work of Wilco Johnson. Released in January 1975, Down by the Jetty with its Johnny Kidd and the Pirates inspired tunes would be the movement's standout LP, impacting the jams Paul Weller and the Boomtown Rats Bob Geldof. More akin to the early flaming groovies, Teenage Depression by Eddie and the Hot Rods, released in November 1976, marks the transition between pub rock and what was next. The Hot Rods would be seen as street rock contemporaries of the Sex Pistols, before the latter would be painted as punk. But the difference was mostly aesthetic, said Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols. If we had played those complicated chords, we would have sounded like Dr. Feelgood, or one of those pub rock bands. The pub rock scene set up the infrastructure making it possible for UK punk to exist. All the venues would be the settings for the first punk gigs, while some pub rock musicians would become key faces in punk, such as Kilburn and the High Roads, Ian Jury, the 101ers, Joe Strummer, Flip City's Elvis Costello, as well as the Stranglers. The Saints were playing shows as early as 1974, were obsessed with the Stooges, and played fast with signature buzzsaw guitars. Like a on a phone. I've got no time to be alone. 
But because they were from Brisbane, Australia, they didn't know that the Ramones or Sex Pistols existed. Their self-released debut single, I'm Stranded, from September 1976, edged out the first UK punk 7-inch by a month. I'm stranded on my own. Promo copies were sent to England to great acclaim. Said sounds, single of this and every week. The singing's flat and disinterested. The guitar's on full stun. It's fabulous. In the aftermath of the single, Australia would develop more punk groups, including Radio Birdman, The Scientists, and Nick Cave's Boys Next Door. With an interest in Bowie, Roxy Music, The Stooges, and The New York Dolls, The Sex Pistols started gigging around London and the surrounding area in 1975. Early sets mostly consisted of covers like Stepping Stone, Roadrunner, and The Who's Substitute. But soon they were writing their own material, as excitement grew around the band. As much as they were taking from the past and putting their own flim-flecked spin on it, they were also reacting to the state of affairs in Britain at the time. Mass unemployment, strikes, rioting, ineffective government, and perhaps worst of all, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. <music> Debut single, Anarchy in the UK, was a reflection of that. This was before they were infamous, before the Bill Grundy show, <laughs> Dirty fucker. the press outrage, before Sid, never mind the bollocks, and their eventual combustion. Removed from that, Anarchy in the UK is a perfect encapsulation of that moment. Informed by the past, adolescent rage distilled into a 7-inch record. Signed to EMI, it was set to be the UK's first punk single. That was until Stiff Records managed to sneak out New Rose by The Damned a month earlier in October 1976. Ah! Over the next few years, dozens of other punk bands sculpted their fury into two to three minute blasts of noise, with many standing the test of time 45 years later. After its initial wave, punk would shoot off into a thousand weird and wonderful directions. Radio didn't want to play it, so New Wave became a thing. The artier punk spun off with post-punk and alternative, while the gnarliest US bands got faster and heavier to form hardcore. And today, punk may not be dead, but its moment as a newspaper selling shock to society has passed us by. Punk is now an attitude more than anything, and that can never die. Thanks for watching. So what do you think? Is there anything I missed? Let me know by commenting down below. If you like this video, why don't you do me a favor and share it with a couple of people. This way I don't have to rely on YouTube to push my videos. I'd also like to shout out my new top tier patrons, The Virtual Traveler, Kian in Holland, and Jason Wendleton. Thanks a bunch to all that support me, and I'll see you in two weeks time for a video I've been wanting to do for a while.